All right, and we are live, everybody. Welcome to the channel. Hello, my name is Tori, and I have the distinct pleasure this evening of hosting a author that has quickly risen to the top of my favorites uh, list, and that is the incredibly talented Fonda Lee. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here this evening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so Fonda, for anybody who doesn't know <laughs> what you've written and, you know, obviously I have the, the one that you're best known for um, behind me, but would you be willing to just give a brief introduction of, of yourself as an author and what you've written? Of course. So I write science fiction and fantasy novels. I debuted in 2015 with a science fiction novel called Zero Boxer. I followed that up with a duology, Exo and Crossfire. And then I published the fantasy trilogy that I'm best known for, the Greenbone Saga, starting with Jade City, Jade War, and Jade Legacy, which came out in 2021. And then I also had a um, spin-off novella off of that series, The Jade Setter of John Loon, as well as a short story collection. And I recently um, released another standalone novella, Untethered Sky. I've got other books in the works. I've written short fiction here and there, comics here and there. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it, me in a nutshell. So I was curious because when I was looking back um, on your canon of work, and I'm very excited to get to Zero Boxer, you made a jump from, and even though they're sister genres, the jump there's a jump from you know sci-fi to fantasy and writing in both genres. So what do you find kind of as a start off is similar yet different about writing between sci-fi and fantasy? Yeah, they're very much two sides of the same mm -hmm. coin for me they don't really actually distinguish themselves that much in my writing process. So I mm -hmm. feel like I approach writing a fantasy novel in a very similar way um, mm -hmm. to approaching a science fiction novel, because I think um, with both genres, you're, um, you're working with the speculative element of either, either magic or technology. Right. And both of those serve very similar narrative purposes. Um, they are really a, a, a lens by which you can um, build out a world that says something about our own world. So um, I, I also think because I write fantasy that is generally pretty grounded mm -hmm. and, uh, I, and for lack of a better term, um, low fantasy, if you will, um, it tends to feel almost a little bit science fictional in yeah. the execution of it. So yeah. um, for me personally, when I'm writing one or the other, um, it, it, the, the process is, is exactly the same. Yeah. Um, I think where science fiction and fantasy distinguish themselves is oftentimes fantasy is in conversation with our past and where we came from. Mm. And science fiction is in conversation with where we are going. And yeah. so those two really complement, I mean, they really complement each other. And there yep. is, of course, a ton of overlap because you you obviously can't have a conversation about the past without extrapolating to where are we going and you can't think about where we're going unless you're thinking about where we came from. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is there's sort of this just natural harmony um, between them. And also, um, you know, there's certain motifs, tropes, aesthetics that are um, very, uh, very specific to science fiction or fantasy mm -hmm. um, and and also can be can be picked up and moved between them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and kind of going not necessarily in the genre specifically, but there was when I read Jade Shards, um, and this might be kind of speaking to the the similarities between the two of, of your writing in general. There was a quote that I actually used as my 2024 quote in my bullet journal um, this year in Jade Shards that says the term epic fantasy conjures an expectation of vast consonants, kingdoms and armies and the rise and fall of nations. But there is also an epic scale to be found in a single life. And I absolutely loved that quote when I read it. And last year I read two series that really made me realize how much I love that concept. And Greenbone was one of them. The idea of this like generational epic that can leave such a huge impact on us over multiple books. So when you're writing something in the scale of Greenbone, how do you design these characters in a world that can hold us through an entire lifetime or multiple lifetimes of, of the characters? And what kind of an impact does that leave on you as an author? 
Well, for one thing, you get really attached to the characters. <laughs> yep, I believe <laughs> you really that. do feel like you know these people. And mm -hmm. I feel like I know the characters in the Greenbone Saga as well as I know anyone in my real life. <laughs> That's right. how much time I've spent with them. Yeah. And um, especially the characters that you know, I, I have written from their youth all the way through in their, their entire life. Um, there's this there's this sense of them just being extremely familiar. Like I got to the point with mm -hmm. those characters where I could write one of them walking into a room and I would know what they would, what their mannerisms were, what they would say when they got into the room, how they would sit down. It just, it felt like they were, they were really old friends, family members to me, um, yeah. which is um, also, I guess, commensurate with the fact that you spend so much time just with, them on the page of the process of writing a book is so lengthy. Right. Um, so there's that aspect of, yes, absolutely. They, they, they become really well known and um, you get to a point of, of familiarity with them where it almost felt like I was a biographer and I was just recording <laughs> yep. their lives as yeah. opposed to having to make stuff up. Um, and in terms of, you know, how do you create that kind of scope Mm -hmm. um, and and keep readers with a character for that length of time. I think um, it, a lot of it comes down to finding that right balance where they are changing, growing, evolving, mm -hmm. but they are still they're still constant. They're right. still um, they're 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 true to themselves. There's still something about them that is always them. Mm -hmm. So that's that, and that's just true for us in our own lives, right? We right. we are essentially the same personality that we are when we were born but we learn through experience and um, we have relationships that change who we are and so finding that authentic level of growth for the characters is I think the thing that keeps them feeling very much like real people and mm -hmm. it's not a linear it's the really thing. It's not like we learn our lesson and we're good like we're done. There are, there are characters <laughs> and for people there's this, we're like evolving and, and we can kind of push out of our comfort zone, but then, you know, we might slide back or we might make some progress in, in some regards, but we sort of um, then take a step back, two steps forward, one step back. Right. So trying to, to um, do that with characters, especially like a whole cast of characters mm -hmm. is, is a challenge because at every, any given time you always want them to be constantly in difficult situations. So you never right. want to let your characters just coast. Um, <laughs> they never, I mean, not, the characters in the Greenbone Saga never get to a point where they're like, and I retire and I'm happy and like, I'm just chilling in my garden. Um, <laughs> right. They're constantly being faced with extremely stressful situations, um, difficult choices, uh, you know, antagonists trying to, to undermine them. Um, and that is sort of the pressure that makes them change and and rise to the occasion but they mm. also they also can't change too much they also have to still still be, be themselves them. yeah yeah well and i think that speaks to the authenticity of the characters when you know and not spoiling any names or any events in the in the series for anybody that hasn't watched or read it but getting to certain points where a character would make a decision and I just, I was so upset and I was so like, oh, what are you doing? But it, but at the same time, I knew it was still them. I could, I could see like, I know you're making this decision because that's mm -hmm. who you are as a person, but I'm not happy with you right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. And also, I mean, if you think back in your own life to decisions you've made, Yep. You know, not all of them are good. All of us have nope. made bad decisions in our lives. But at the time, we're not like, I want to make a bad decision. Right? Like, <laughs> every, <laughs> with, We're always trying to kind of do the best that we can. And we make the decisions that we do, given the information we have at the time, the circumstances right. surrounding us, the pressures that we're under. And I try to just remember that with the characters as well. Right. Well, and uh, Pete, who's a big fan of your series, the real question is, do you ever intend to hurt your readers <laughs> or write something and kind of say, oh, someone is going to cry over this? <laughs> I don't intend to hurt my... Okay, hurting my readers is sort of the natural byproduct of hurting my characters and right. hurting myself. So yep. um, I, I firmly believe there's no tears for the reader until there's 
tears for the writer. So right. all those scenes, any scene, just, just please trust me, any scene that hurt you hurt me as more. well. And it hurt me <laughs> first and more. Right. So I'm just right. sort of passing on the pain. I think that's, <laughs> that's just fair. Yeah, you know, misery loves company. As exactly. authors, we just want to bring other people in. And this, do you see how much this hurts? <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about before we went live about that kind of symbiotic relationship between the author and the readers that exists even more now in in modern the, the modern industry of writing. But I think there's kind of a third factor of that where we have the symbiotic relationship between the author and the characters and the reader. And there's mm -hmm. kind of that trio that just kind of fluidly shares emotion mm -hmm. <laughs> through the experience of the book, which is, inc it's an incredible thing that we can do that as people. It is. And it's, it's very cool. I, I feel like I've done my job when people disagree vehemently about my characters. Mm -hmm. so if, if I see readers just having completely different takes on yep. a character and, you know, they might, one, one reader might view a certain character's actions, um, as a, in a certain way and have very yes. strong opinions. And, and yes. there'll be another reader that feels, completely different. I feel like then I've done my job in making them seem real because nobody agrees on people in real life. Yeah. Right? So um, if, if the character is real enough that people can disagree about them, that's a good sign in my opinion. Did we freeze for a second? Okay. Oh, we did. We froze for a second, but we're okay. back. I think we're good. <laughs> um, Morally gray characters are something that I feel like we talk about in the fantasy genre a lot. And one of the things that I loved about Greenbone that I that I don't always see in, in the fantasy books that I read is that in those decisions that the characters are making, the, the authenticity of the characters was such that I never felt as if you were telling me as the author how to feel about any of the decisions that were being made, that it was just the characters were off coming off the page, like you said, and they're like real people. And I was just left to kind of be the bystander and watch what's going on and make my own decisions and be a part of that world. And I actually think that that's a really difficult um, spot as an author to get to that point where you just invite the reader in to that extent. And I really, mm -hmm. really appreciated that. Well, that was definitely my intent. So I'm, I'm glad that that's what you got out of it. Um, and I, I think that's my, I, that's just the style that I prefer as a reader as well. And so same. oftentimes as, as, as a writer, I'm trying to evoke the same experience that I would want to have as a reader. And right. I, I, I like, I, I guess it comes from two things. First of all, I, I want the, um, the story to feel cinematic. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. in, from that regard, often you're, you, you're, you're watching everything unfold. I want it to unfold in the reader's mind as in, in a right. cinematic way. But also um, the, the tone that I take, my authorial voice has a certain, um, I don't, I'm not sure what the right word is, but all, almost like a, 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 a certain distance to it. Just a, sure. yep. just, a, just a little bit of that almost slightly journalistic distance to it, yeah. where I want you to just experience it as if I'm not telling you the story. Right. That yeah. would, that's kind of my ideal. I, 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 um, I think beautiful prose is as an absolute virtue, but also I want it to just kind of disappear and right. for you to just kind of see it happening without yeah. really the author's thumb on the page. Right. And I think that kind of speaks to what you mentioned earlier about you being kind of the biographer almost like when someone writes a biography they're just laying out the details of this person's life and we're invited to come along and watch and and be part mm -hmm. of that and yeah like I'd never thought of it that way but I would say it's written very much in that kind of a style where it feels like you're writing the biography of this this people and and this family and this world and that's really a cool way to invite the reader in as part of the process which I appreciate so thank you for that yeah, <laughs> Um, so we, we kind of touched on like low or modern fantasy a little bit. And one of the things that I remember getting done with the series and I and my husband read it at the same time when we had a lot of great discussions about it. The magic system was one that came up often in terms of how incredibly naturally it felt integrated into this very modern kind of fantasy world. And 
I know in my vlog for Jade, Jade City, one of the first things I said was, I'm not used to seeing a fantasy map with an airport on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and But secondly, there you merged this very ancient kind of magic with the Jade into a very modern setting. And I'm curious how what is harder and what is easier about mm. bringing magic into a modern setting than it would be for our typical like ancient, you know, kind of magical settings? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I've also written fantasy that's set in a pre-modern yep. time. So I can I can definitely say that on, on the easier front, setting a fantasy world in a more modern era means you don't have to think as hard about how everything gets done. So yes. one of the difficult <laughs> things about writing pre-modern fantasy is I would always be writing along and then get like hung up on on how simple things would happen. So right. things like, okay, they go into a dark room. Is it like an oil lamp? Did they light a torch? How yep. do you even like light it? And like, if they want to cook food. Is there like a hearth? Is the cooking <laughs> outdoors? Like, do they have to turn the butter? Like what? There's all these <laughs> right. steps, these pre-modern steps that that I, I, I would like, stop and have to be like, wait, how, how, how does that work? How does that work? <laughs> and even things like, okay, they need to get from point A to point B. I would have to be like, okay, so how many miles can a horse cover in a day? And like, how, when do they need to stop to feed the horses? And I don't know anything about horses and oh my goodness. <laughs> so there's, that was one aspect um, of writing a modern fantasy that I just, I, I, I loved being able to be like, they walk into the room and they turn on the light or they, right. they heat up their tea in the, in, you know, and on the kettle with the kettle or they yep. microwave their dinner. And like, I, you know, how, like, how that works. Like, works, how that all that works. Right. And the reader does as well. And so it's, it's all just, it, it all feels very natural. Um, on the yep. more difficult side of things, one of the challenges with writing um, a fantasy set in a more modern era is that um, you know how more things more work, but so does everyone else. And they, they get very, people get more <laughs> hung up about yeah. um, specific times and places. So for example, if I read a pre-modern fantasy, most people are not like, well, was this 1545 or was right. it 1641? And which part of ancient Germany did you base this on? And mm -hmm. so they kind of accept because it's so long ago and it's so right. pre-modern. It's kind it's of its kind own of, fantasy. It's just kind of its own big, giant, broad spectrum of right. like, ancient. And we kind of just accept that. Um, but when I was writing the Greenbone Saga, it, I'm using, I'm in a modern era, but people remember in, in a time frame that people <laughs> remember. So right. people would always be wanting to know, well, is this kind of like more 1950s or more 1960s? And I'd be like, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't but matter. They, <laughs> and, they, and also the specificity of place too. They really want sure. to know that I base it on, was it right. Hong Kong or was it Taiwan or was it Japan or was it China? Right. And, and so um, there was there was that challenge of almost like, trying to suspend, make the reader just suspend Not his care. belief and accept it in the yeah. same way that they would if it was a pre-modern fantasy, they would just do that. But, right. uh, but yeah, so yeah, a little, a little different challenge either way. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I can, even, even when you're, you know, it's hard to get the reader so much. Like if I write an ancient fantasy and I say, this is the land of Kikon, nobody says anything. But if we have modern fantasy, and this is the island of Kikon, everybody's like, so is that Japan? Right. <laughs> is that, yeah. So yeah, definitely can see that. So yeah, yeah. and actually one of the other things that was, um, was, was a bit of a challenge that was interesting for writing a modern fantasy was um, because technology advanced so much faster in modern times, mm -hmm. I also had to think about what the equivalent tech was. Sure. So I had, I had sort of an idea of when I would peg the story. So um, I, I would, as the series progressed, technology would also evolve. And I had to be like, okay, are they in like, at what point does, does Jaya get a flip phone? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There's, and I think that was something that I really appreciated too, with the, with the magic system incorporate, like it didn't, for me, at least, there was an immediate suspension of disbelief because of the way that the jade abilities, which are a more kind of ancient magic system, mm -hmm. are worked into this modern setting. It all just kind of melded together. And I never really, even when people are, you know, jumping off of things and landing perfect, I, I it never like felt weird mm -hmm. <laughs> to me. And I just kind of was like, yep, 
Hilo can do that. Because, well, partially because he's Hilo, but also because <laughs> Jade, sure. Right, right. Cool. <laughs> um, so with that, where where did you, the idea for the Jade magic specifically come mm -hmm. from? And you kind of, again, going back to that balance between the magic and the martial arts and the technology, like how do you know when to lean on each of yeah. those aspects? Yeah. Uh, well, the Jade magic really just came about from uh, the the like overpowered martial arts yep <laughs> movie, <laughs> movie superheroes right? yep, like, yep. this is cool yeah how does that make sense how did he punch through the wall like he just jumped like 30 feet and he landed <laughs> <on>. what <laughs> so, so yep. there there was that i mean there's a suspension of disbelief when you when you watch because you know there's a wire <laughs> right exactly you <laughs> right, know yeah, there's yeah. a wire right yeah. but you don't see the wire. So in my, so my, my fantasy brain was like, okay, but it's not a wire. It's magic. <laughs> right. Yep. So that's, that's where Jade magic came from. But as for balancing it with the, with the tech, I actually, I loved that part. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy writing a world that's incredibly uh, recognizable, but then just taking that one speculative element and, and, putting it in there and seeing yes. how it changes everything and it like ripples throughout. So I actually really, really enjoyed having the Jade magic um, change and evolve along with kind of its relationship yeah. with technology. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, as the, as, as the, especially as the, as the series goes on, um, the Jade, Ma Jade magic isn't unaffected by, right things like international trade and by technology right. i mean the whole series really starts off because technology has caught up with this ancient right um ability this 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 one resource that was confined to this place and to these people and right. the modern world has found it and figured out how to harness it through pharmaceuticals and that's kind of a, the turning point in that world that kicks right. off a lot of things and as the story goes on everything from like yeah how would you know the, some of the jade abilities work if you had sniper rifles or helicopters. <laughs> right. or, you know, those <laughs> yep. those were the things that I I, I loved playing with that. And yeah. Like, okay. How do I make it feel just like it works well together and they they blend right. together? Yeah. Well, and I think as an author, it's so much fun to get into a world like that and say, okay, what if? Right. What if we had jade magic and helicopters? How how can we play with that? Like it's it's a fun. And that's, I think, why sci-fi and fantasy is such a fun genre or fun pair of genres, because you can play with it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I had the scope in this story as well to just take that one speculative element and and show it in, in a bunch of different contexts. Right. So, for example, uh, the movie industry. Of course, you would end up with some of these <laughs> yes. Jade Warriors being on screen. I mean, how could you not? Right. I mean, or, right. or like, um, um, you know, the, or, or like east or um, um combat sports right yeah. of course there would be a place that was like i don't know vegas where there would be <laughs> people gambling on like, right on on jade powered uh yeah you know, sports fights so, so um so following that train of thought and and taking the speculative element into or all the different aspects of the world is a huge part of the fun of the world building well, and I, as you were saying that, I just it just occurred to me that in like the movie industry, if you have a green bone as your protagonist in a film, you don't have to pay the stunt double, right? <laughs> which is great, yeah. <laughs> saves you money, and also is cool. <laughs> um, and and like kind of going along with that, I, I was so Jade War blew my mind. Because I know a lot of authors who really know the nitty gritty of how their world works. But I it was just mind blowing how many details that you clearly knew and threaded uh, through about the world that you were writing in and the, the business and the economics and the politics and the cultures and how they react to each other. And and there's there's such a massive amount of information there that I was just kind of like, Wow, <laughs> like how how do you integrate? Like how do you build all that from from scratch and also keep it all straight? <laughs> Tori, I have no idea. 
because I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I honestly, I have times I look at those books and I'm like, how did, how did you write this? Just, there's, so, there's so much, so big. There's a lot um, in but, there. You know, I, I, I honestly can't even answer that because it, it was a lot to keep yeah. track of. Um, and I, I think part of it was just... <laughs> Was, was just being steeped in. I mean, I know I did. Yeah. There was a ton of research. There's a lot of files. There's all all these notes that I have. Um, but I, but it it is. It really is just. It's like one thing at a time. Um, yeah. And especially when it when it came to all the other countries in the world and all the different places, I always just had to keep in mind like what what are the characters seeing and right. what's important for the narrative and. What do I, what's important to show? Right. So an example of that would be like when, when this, hopefully this is, we don't get into spoiler, ter spoiler, <laughs> spoiler territory yet, but when one of the main characters goes to another country and lives yes. there for a while, yes. I didn't, you know, I, I had to be selective yeah. about what part of that world and that society was important. And really right. um, his experience was with kind of the expatriate community yep. there and yep. how there's kind of an underground greenbone culture there and so we see a lot of that um yep. in contrast you know there's the uiwa islands which is where a lot of jade gets smuggled and i didn't i mean i i don't really say anything about i don't know fashion there or <laughs> right. yep, the, yep. even like you know the government and how that's run what was important to the characters and to the story was um the, the smuggling that was happening there right. and the relationship between the Uiwa Islands and KCON because of that. And, and so a lot of what we saw there was, a, was a focused around that aspect. But there's this trick that we writers have to do, which is we show enough of the iceberg that you yes. believe that there is this there's huge more. amount of stuff. So you only you see the bit of it and it implies the rest of, yes. the, of the iceberg. Yeah. So, so with that, are there any world building details specifically that you feel like you tend to focus on to kind of bring it to life more? For me, the thing that brings a world to life the most is the day-to-day -day details mm -hmm. and having the characters just live yeah. their lives. I think what makes the world feel real is um, you know, what, what they do when they get up in the morning, how they pay for something at the store, what they eat, what, yep. how they watch sports, um, you know, what's entertainment, the sayings that they have, the idioms, the phrases, the little things like tugging your earlobe to ward off bad luck or, you know, um, uh, spinning on a blade for good luck or, you know, yep. the little day-to-day -day traditions and um, sort of the norms of that society and how characters go through their day um, right. and that's I, I think the best way to accomplish that on the page is just have your characters move around and do stuff mm -hmm. um, so there's scenes for example like I had one scene in Jade City where um, Shane and and meet at a sporting event so yeah. that was an opportunity for me to show how show a school event and sports and it feels kind of very like normal life, like, you know, I've, I've like, you'd go see any other sort of school sporting event, right. but it's, but it's KCON, it's different. And, and <laughs> yep. it or I had, um, you know, uh, Shay and I, Mata meet in the temple. So mm -hmm. now you have a, a sense of what religion is like in the world. Um, right. So it's really just kind of making sure that you're following, that it's like a reality TV show, but for yeah. your world. Yeah, and you're you're utilizing whatever environment the characters are in as more than just a backdrop, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a couple of questions from that I wanted to jump in, and this one it kind of takes a little bit of a swerve into character, but this was one that I actually had thought of also to ask and forgot to put it on my. So thank you, Aditha. Um, what or who was the most difficult character to write? And I know this is a tough question for authors because it's like, who's your favorite child? Uh -huh. <laughs> Did you have a favorite? Uh, most difficult character to write? Probably Shay. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. she was probably the most difficult to write just because um, she 
she was balancing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's yeah. like, <laughs> and, and, you know, she's also a more introspective character. Mm -hmm. She has a lot of um, doubts about her path in life in different mm -hmm. times. Um, she is trying to be true to the, her clan and to her family and the Greenbone tradition she represents, but she's also modern thinking and has been educated abroad and she's trying to um, push the clan forward and progress it. Um, into the modern era. So she's just, she's got a lot going on and um, a lot. And, and, and so she was a little bit harder to really put, to put herself out on the, mm -hmm. on the page, if you will. Yeah. So yeah. I, I had to find kind of the right ways and times to um, make sure that she was really known. Right. Um, right. So, see, so she was probably the most challenge but then again she's one of my favorite characters i love writing her yeah yeah but she's ch more challenging and then yeah. i don't have my favorite character um <laughs> i mean my my favorite character to write was hilo yeah because he just <laughs> he just made it so easy for me he was just he had his you know wore his heart on the sleeve he was who yep. he was he would just walk into a scene and he'd be like i know what he's gonna say yep so it was almost like i could kind of i mean take it easy i was never i felt like it was easy ever but I got <laughs> right right I, I almost felt like I didn't have to um I'd have to work very hard with Hilo yeah yeah for him to just come out and tell me what it was yeah that he was gonna do yeah well and I think in in some ways characters like that kind of serve as maybe an anchor for the reader too mm -hmm. because I felt the same way as a reader where I didn't know what anybody else was gonna do, but I pretty much always knew what Hilo was gonna do. And that was that was kind of an anchoring feeling as I was reading to know like, okay, Hilo's in the room. So I have I at least have right, some right. semblance of awareness of what right. might happen next. <laughs> um, and then the other question Anita had for you was essentially how much of the ending did you know mm -hmm. when you started? So the Without ending spoilers anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I wrote Jade City, I didn't know if it would be a trilogy or not. Okay. So I wrote the book. I knew what the I, I knew what the ending of Jade City would be. And I knew that there was the potential for a much bigger story. Yeah. But I hadn't sold the book yet. So I right. wrote the book and had only kind of the vaguest idea of what I would do next if I got to write more books in the series. And then when it sold in a three book deal and my editor said, so what are you going to do for books two and three? That's when I uh. <laughs> sat down and started to think more um, in a more organized way about the second book and the third book. Yeah. And at that point, I had a rough idea of what the second, the shape of the second book. And I had almost no idea what would happen in the third book. But I knew, I knew pretty much the shape of the whole the whole thing and i yeah. knew that it was it was really going to be a family saga of this mm -hmm. this family and that the arc of the story would be this war between no peak and the mountain clan so that was mm -hmm. i knew that was going to be the ending it was essentially the end of the war then when i started writing um the next two books the final scene in jade legacy came to me pretty early on mm -hmm. and i'm one of those writers who can't really write until i know what the ending is yep so I had that final scene, no spoilers, but that final scene in Jade Legacy where two characters are talking in a room. Yeah. That has been in my mind for for a very, very long time. There's there's got to be a sense of relief when when that you finally comes reach out. it. Yes. yes, and everybody else knows what you've been having to hold yeah. in your head for so long. Yeah. Um I think I wanted oh, there we go. Um the other thing that it that you uh, kind of came to me while you were talking about Shay is I think now that I'm looking at the main cast, I th it Shay was also kind of the character that we got the most details about all of the details of the world and the mm -hmm. economics and the because she was paying the most attention to it right. as her character would. So maybe she's the one that had it all in her head and you're just yes. writing her story. Yeah, I mean, she's got a lot of scenes where she has to think pretty hard about like geopolitical considerations. So like <laughs> yeah, which was incredibly, I was just like, 
I just, uh, my suspension of disbelief was so high because I was like, I have no idea what's going on, but I know that Shay does. And that's <laughs> reassuring sometimes. <laughs> um, so one of the other things with all of those threads and, and as you're kind of coming up with the story, were there directions that surprised you as the author? Did the story take any different paths than you originally thought it would? Sometimes. So I, I would say the overall story, I stayed true to what, mm -hmm. where I knew it would go. Yeah. Um, but there were absolutely times where I was like, I don't know how these three plot threads are going to come together because <laughs> there were a lot of plot threads. <laughs> yeah. So there were, there were absolutely times where I was like, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And I know these are connected, don't, but I don't exactly know how. And yeah. um, what was really um, satisfying and wonderful were, was the fact that they would, there would always be some way that they did connect and they came together in a cool scene. So um, for example, I remember this one time I was I was driving up to a convention I was in the car with another friend of mine who was a writer and I was I was just like venting about the story I was in the middle of writing Jade War at this time yeah and I said there's just I there's this dead space in the middle mm. and like I I know that something is supposed to happen in the middle of this book and also like Shay is doing all this stuff but I don't know like where it's leading and I also don't know like Oh, and then I, Maude is doing this stuff. And anyways, I just talked I just talked it all out. Yep. And I realized I, all these things were meant to, to come together. And there's, right. this, there's this big scene in the middle of the second book. Yep. And I didn't know that scene was going to happen when I started writing the book. But then when I figured it out, it was like, oh, yeah. Like, okay. This That's is all, why all those pieces all makes are sense. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like part of that is like when you've built a world like that, that you can trust you can trust it a little bit to like, okay, I don't know how we're going to end up there, but I trust the characters and the world that's there to, to help me out somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of do a question out of order here because Anitha brought up uh, somebody that we definitely need to talk about because she is an incredibly compelling antagonist. And I have had so many conversations about this character with other people who love the Greenbone saga. And that, of course, is our wonderful antagonist, Aitmata. Um, and I think, Anitha, you know, this was the same question I have on my list right here. And that is, I think we'd all love to know <laughs> kind of what went into creating her as a character and what traits do you feel are really important to creating mm -hmm. that really nuanced, compelling antagonist? Yeah. I think it's a pretty common saying, but it's a really accurate one that every antagonist is the protagonist of their own yeah. story. Yeah. And that was 100% the mentality that I went into with Aitmata. I very much wanted her to be the sort of character that I could tell the entire Greenbone saga over again, but from yep. her point of view. And she would be the, she hero. Would be the hero of yeah. that story. Yep. Um, so I... I knew that she would be a great antagonist if I could get her to that point. And I initially just conceived of the premise of her um, in a way that just made kind of set her up for success as an antagonist, right. if you will, because yeah. um, I had created this world that I, I knew was, was very traditional, that had this long history um, that was male dominated, very mm -hmm. testosterone heavy. And I made <laughs> yep. her the first female leader of a major clan who basically had to, fight and kill her way into power. So right. she already came with a history of both ruthlessness and success. So right. I'd already kind of given her a backstory mm -hmm. that gave her a great antagonist resume to begin with. Yeah. Um, and then from there on in, she it was just always, um, you know, and, and this is a challenge with writing a character like Aitmata and, and a few other characters as well. It's like, I'm pretty sure my character is smarter than I am. Yes. So I have to like write <laughs> That's so Someone scary. Someone who's smarter than me. Like, how do I do that? So that that is that can be challenging because yes. thirty times I'm like, I know she has a plan. What is it? It's she's <laughs> going to be really smart. I'm not smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, fortunately for me, I had a lot of time. <laughs> right, <laughs> but, right. But um, but yeah, it's uh, it it is, it it's very it's also challenging 
to have a character really come onto the page when they're not a POV mm -hmm. character. And I've had yeah. people ask, well, why didn't you just make Aimata a POV character? Mm -hmm. And um, my answer is really because A, it was more challenging to do it without her being a POV character. And also yeah. because she's such a forceful personality that I didn't want her to take over the story. Like this is the story <laughs> of the cult family. This is my story now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And she could, I, I could easily see, you know, and her ending up, it would be weird to have like one chapter from Aitmata's point right. of view. It'd just be like this weird, it'd be this weird anomaly. And you'd be like, what? One chapter? That's it? Like that's you're it. So she would have had, ended up having to be a major POV character, would have completely changed the tone of the story. And yeah, so I, it, it ended up just, I think, being the really the right decision that we see right. her from the Call family's point of view, because she's right. just even more... A force of her own. <laughs> even more intimidating and dangerous when you don't know what she's up to. Like, you know, the Calls are doing all this stuff. And from the point of view of the reader and from the Call family, they're a hot mess. Like, right. all this, and <laughs> yep. I'm sure Aymata's got her problems. For sure. But from the outside, she seems like she's just got it all together. Yeah. Well, and it would have been by Aitmata if if we if you'd let her have that much space, I think. Um but yes, I to completely agree with this, just that I, I I love an antagonist where you, like you said, you can completely, even though you're like, I can't believe that you did that. And I'm so angry about it. I still get it, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is almost more. And, and I hesitate. I, I use the word antagonist specifically because I, I hesitate using the word villain mm -hmm. with Aitmata because it doesn't feel right. It's like right. she is, but, but she's not, you know, cause she's right. the hero in her own story. And I think she's that only a, a villain from the point of view of right. The calls, the calls. Yeah. Um, and Pete wanted to know, would you ever re rewrite the whole thing <laughs> from, probably not the whole thing, but um, from I, Mata's perspective? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> she would take over the story completely. It's, temp it's tempting, but, yeah. but no. Yeah. Well, and for anybody who doesn't know this or hasn't read Jade Shards yet, um, there is definitely some more Aitmata content mm -hmm. in that short story collection that I thought was really illuminating in terms of her character and and i i think the origin story was a good place to go with that where it wasn't dropped somewhere in the middle of greenbone it was mm -hmm. let's see aitmata in a in a capacity that we haven't seen her before and i really liked that so because we brought jade shards up i have to ask did you like how did you decide which because there's so mm -hmm. much there's so many different pieces you could have pulled out for that how did yeah. you decide which stories you were going to include it was kind of random honestly mm -hmm. it was whatever you it felt was, it, it was honestly a situation where i didn't even write them with the intention of publishing them mm -hmm. i had finished jade legacy and i wasn't really ready to let these characters yeah. go. And so I ended up writing these stories just for my own entertainment and yeah. um, because I wanted to spend more time with the characters. And going back and writing prequel short stories really just kind of was a balm for my writer's soul. I got to yeah. go back to these characters I'd spent so much time with and see them when they were young. So it kind of felt like going full circle back to the beginning. Yeah. And I um, wrote them and I was like, well, I might as well do something with them. I've written them. So I started Thank putting you. them out on Patreon <laughs> and then um, and then Subpress, which did the Jay Setter of John Lou novella said, well, do you want to just turn it into a collection? I was like, sure. Yay. So it, just, it worked out well that way. Um, but it really was just because I wanted to go back to the main characters and do kind of a an origin yeah story um with them and see them when they were young before like all this stuff happened everything them. happens <laughs> yeah yeah and that was i think you know i i've heard some people ask oh should i read those first and then and then do Greenbone?" and from and i please you know include your own thoughts on this too as a reader i needed the healing journey that mm -hmm. was jade setter and jade shards after Greenbone saga i think yeah. if i had read them before they would not have had the same impact on yeah. me 
if I'd read them first and then right. gotten the green bone. And so they're almost like a you know, you're, you're torn and broken. And I remember, you know, tagging you on Twitter with like, I've got a box of Kleenexes at the end of Jade legacy here. And like 30 minutes later, I was in Jade setter. Cause I was like, I need more. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I have, I've told people that it's definitely um, the, both the novella and the short stories are going to be more enjoyable and they're going to resonate more. Yeah from a character standpoint, if you do the trilogy first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think you'd ever go back or was that kind of your final send off to, to the, the green bone? I don't know. I would have said no. Yeah. Because I'd spent so many years in the story world and with these characters. Yeah. But um, also I, I do love that world. So right. um, I have so many other projects I need to work on. Right. But if I, <laughs> And I also feel like I told the story of the Cole family. Yeah. I'm, I'm yep. kind of done telling that story that I set out to tell. So right. the only reason I'd go back to that world is if, um, if I needed to, if there was a right. completely different story and maybe in a different time frame with different characters yeah. um, that I needed to tell in that, yeah. in that world. Yeah. And I mean, that is true. Like the, the scope of what you've created in, in Green Boat already is such a complete, you know, arc of, of the family. And I wasn't as much as I, I just wanted to go read it again. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I didn't feel like there was anything missing, but it was the, I want to go back just so I can be in it again, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, I, I completely understand that. So kind of moving from, we started with the antagonist. I want to move to our, our protagonist, depending on whose story you're telling <laughs> side of things. Um, there's such a balance of, of character types within your kind of main Motley crew cast of, mm -hmm. of the, the No Pete clan. And just for the main POVs, why was each of them important to the story that you wanted to tell? Yeah, well, I conceived of this saga as a family saga right from the yeah. beginning. And so I needed this family to have really compelling relationships. Yep. And that's really the heart of the story is the relationships between these characters. 100%. So I started very much, um, you know, from the standpoint of, and I love sibling relationships in fiction. I just, I love them. <laughs> yep. I, I, I 100% was like, okay, it's going to be a story about these siblings and it's going to encapsulate their generation. Right. This, this, this generation of green bones. And so I started off really with kind of, broad strokes archetypes and this is way back in the beginning when I was yeah. developing the concept and I started with like okay there's the there's the responsible eldest son right and then yep. there's the you know, the spoiled youngest daughter um and, and uh then there's like the temperamental middle kid <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and then oh and then I've got like the adopted kid who like you know is part of the family but still always feels a little out of it and so mm. I I I had very very broad brush strokes. And then as I developed the story and the world and where I wanted to go with the narrative, it was like this, this um, process of filling in mm -hmm. these outlines and, and making them like, it's like I started with, I don't know, just a sketch of stick figures. And then yep. it, it got more and more fleshed out and filled in until the particular kind of recognizable, very, very sort of generic relationship that you might have of like, okay, well, there's your responsible oldest sibling and he kind right. of, you know, and the relationship he has with like the youngest sibling, but now it's specific to right. Blonde and Shay. And so yeah. the specifics all kind of came together. And I think right. the reason why each of these siblings was so important to the story was also they all have a slightly different relationship with the clan and with right. Jade Right. And with their place in Greenbone society. So by having this cast of characters that have that different position and mm -hmm. that, that different outlook on the world, I get a chance to flesh that world out more fully because right. you are seeing it from all these different perspectives. Right. And um, the way, you know, uh, Shay views, the, views her role in Greenbone society is very different from how Andon does, which mm -hmm. is very different from, from Hilo and Lon. Um, and and it extends beyond the main call family as well. Um, right. So a character like Barrow, who started off as like, here's just this minor character who shows up yep. and causes chaos, 
he ended up being super valuable to me as a character yeah. because you could see the world from his perspective and that gave the world a, a, a realness yeah. because his view was valid as well. I mean, right. <laughs> As, mu see why as much as it pains me to say that, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, he, he's, he's coming from a completely different, yeah. you know, view on, on the world you've created than anyone right. in the call family. Right. Um, so yeah, that we'll get to him. <laughs> <laughs> I jotted a note on my paper at the end and all it just says is Barrow because <laughs> we're going to get there. <laughs> um, so, I mean, maybe we've kind of made this question a, a moot point, but as someone who is currently working through my second book in a trilogy, I would love to hear your advice on tackling sequels and that second mm -hmm. book syndrome. And I know we talked a little bit about keeping all of the threads um, <laughs> straight, but yeah. I would, what advice do you have for for people who are moving past the standalone and, and working on something yeah. on a bigger scale. Yeah. I've, I was recently teaching a class about writing mm. trilogies and mm. um, a few of the main things that I said in that was um, first of all, every book, when you, when you're writing a trilogy, every book has to have its own shape, its own character yeah. and have its own arc. And I think that's where the struggle with second books comes from. Sure. Is that we're thinking the first book opens the story and the third book finishes it. And the right. second book too often becomes just a, link between the right. first and the third book and right. it doesn't have its own shape it doesn't have its own thing going on so i was terrified of the second book after mm -hmm. i finished and jade city, jade city um you know it was it, it it was uh i mean it was well received when it came out and so there was there were there was i felt a lot i put pressure. a lot of pressure on myself yeah. with that second book because I knew that when it came to trilogies, the second book was the make it or break it book. That was the book that was going to either make the series soar or it was going to fall flat on its face. So mm -hmm. I studied, I obsessively studied sequels. And mm. um, the, the thing that I concluded was that successful sequels are the ones that um, take big risks and it pays yeah. off for them. Yeah. So the more you, you can... Um, you, and the, the sequels that, that do that, they often um, do something unexpected mm -hmm. and, and change kind of your, either the, the tone of the story, the direction that it's going, something fundamental about the characters. And so that was something that I, that I kept in mind really strongly when I was writing Jade War was this book has to do more and it has to have some of the like, the biggest payoff moments have to be in the second book. Right. Um, and then the other thing also is, to remember is that there, when you're writing a series, the whole series has its has an, an overall uh, overall chain, three. yeah, um, and that goes across all three. But then there's also threads that go from book one to two that you need to close off in book two, and then you need to still open new threads in right. book two, in book two to carry into book three. So you're you're juggling a lot, and that second yeah. book juggles the most out of all of them. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that helped me was always knowing what the book wasn't. Mm -hmm. So the series, because it's a bigger canvas, you you can end up with severe scope creep. <laughs> you can end up <laughs> like, now I've introduced another dozen characters in another right. country. And so it can, it, and I, I think this is where you know, some fantasy series struggle, right? Is they kind of, um, out, they, they grow so big that you don't right. see how they can possibly conclude in a satisfactory way. Right. I, I very much wanted to avoid that because I love fantasy series, but I, I also really love series that end. So I was <laughs> determined that I was going to end the series. I, and I, in order to do that, I had to build a fence around sure. my story. And for me, the fence was, this is at its heart, it's a family saga. It's about the Cull family. So right. if I find myself on a tangent where half the book is with like characters in, <laughs> that are unrelated to the call family, I've gone wrong somewhere. Right. So having that fence, knowing that this is, these are the borders of the series yeah. was very helpful. Yeah, for sure. Um, so kind of along with that, before we go into spoilers, cause I definitely have some spoilery questions. Um, overall, what advice would you leave for new writers on the edge of tackling a series for the first time? And mm. what do you wish you had known before you started? Uh, how long it would take? 
<laughs> I, I honestly think that is something that um, that is that is just worth knowing going in. Yeah, that, you know, it's a big commitment. Yeah, um, and uh, you're going to spend years years on on a series. Um, so that's probably just the, the biggest like be prepared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That I can say, um, and also um, think about how each book is going to be different. Um, and you don't have to know everything that's going to happen. I mean, it's almost impossible to know what's going to happen in the third book in a series when you're writing the first one. Right. But um, even if you have some sense of where it's going, and this helped me a lot because with the Greenbone Saga, after I knew it was going to be three books, um, my my plan was to expand the story um, with each book, but in a different way. So Jade War was going to be the international expansion. Mm -hmm. So Jade City was very contained um, in John Loon, um, on KCON, and I knew book two was going to um, blow open the doors in a global sense. So mm -hmm. was, okay, characters go to different countries, it becomes a big international intrigue. Um, so that was that was what gave Jade sh war its shape. And then Jade mm -hmm. Legacy, I knew, was going to become intergenerational. Right. And that's where I knew it was, was going to be this big um, uh, time frame that I was dealing with. Uh, the younger characters were going to grow up. Yep. And that's how I, that's in my mind, how I distinguished each book. Sure. As kind of each section of the story right. you were telling. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I am going to throw on a spoiler discussion banner so that everyone knows. So anyone in the chat who has not read Greenbone Saga, first of all, stop watching if you care about spoilers and go buy yourself a copy of Jade City and start reading so you can come back and watch. Um, but the, the I, I wrote his name. I didn't even have a question. <laughs> so I'll just start with him. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Anita had a couple other ones I wanted to get to as well, but um, so you mentioned that Barrow was just kind of meant to be, you know, this this moment in time, and then he ends up being a very strong through thread through all three books, mm -hmm. and this i honestly out of everything in the book this is one of the things that i think as a writer i'm most impressed by was the ending of his character because you knew that's not what everybody was like hoping <laughs> for the whole time and yet somehow it's perfect like and I was almost mad <laughs> that it was so perfect and i couldn't fault anything of of how you ended his his arc <laughs> but from the moment my husband can tell everybody like the moment he went for Lon's grave I was like we have a blood feud forever <laughs> forever <laughs> if I could jump through the page right now I would <laughs> so tell me about Barrow <laughs> yeah. so Barrow ended up being probably one of the best surprises that I've had as a writer yeah. In that I initially imagined Barrow as a framing device. So when sure. I was writing Jade City, I sort of thought of him as a George R. R. Martin style minor character sure. who shows up in the first scene and then dies, right? And so <laughs> right. the reason yeah. why I wanted Barrow to begin with was because he is an outsider yes. to the clan. And he has a very simplistic understanding of the world. I mean, it's very self serving and it's yes. very, I mean, he's very determined. He's very dogged in his own way mm -hmm. but he has he basically is like this is the thing that makes people powerful in the world and, and I, I want that. I don't have it and I want it right so he was a really great way for me to introduce Jade and why it was coveted and yes. if I had just started with Lon and Hilo having a discussion I mean they are so steeped in the world it would be right it, it would be hard for a reader to immediately join a clan leadership discussion and know what the heck was going on because they right. already know these characters live in the world, they breathe it. It's like trying to get a fish to describe water, right? It's, right. It's like, it would be hard. But yeah. Barrow um, was a perfect entry place. Mm -hmm. um, and also he was a way to just start the story um, in with this, this very sort of easy, narrow 
um, point of view and then kind of expand from there. So that's what Barrow's initial purpose was. And then I figured, oh, he could kind of, and then, then I went from, okay, he's going to show up to, well, he's going to show up and then he's going to show up a couple of other places. And then at the end, he's going to die. That's kind of, that was what I initially thought. It'll kind of be the, the book and the story. Right. And then, um, he became really useful to me. So he yeah. ended up sticking around because I realized <laughs> that he played a really important role. I mean, he also, he not only did he see things and do things that were, that were related to what the main characters were involved in, but on a, from a completely different perspective and a right. different level. Um, he was a way for the care, for the story to not feel so insular and so clan dominated you every once in a while i like forced you as a reader right. to come out of that and come be like out, oh yep. right like there there's people like barrow and here's, here's what's going on <laughs> and um and so as a result um i think the turning point for me and barrow was when he's involved um with what happens to lawn in the middle of the book and then i was like okay that that particular connection means that he's an important character now Right. And that means he can't just be, you know, casually discarded. He, he has right. a role. It's almost like he became, so there's a, there's a lot of, um, a lot, a theme of kind of fortune and fate and luck Yes, uh, runs throughout a lot of the, the, the series and also in um, the green bones view of the world mm -hmm. and this idea of the gods, right. The gods kind of playing dice with humans and, right. and, and, and so, Barrow kind of kind of came to represent that. He came to yeah. represent it was like this force of chaos. And that's what he was for the story. He was like a force of chaos. Right. And so he became the like embodiment of uh, of luck and chaos and kind of the unknowable will of like, yeah. fate and fortune. Um, yeah. and he is also like the victim of that. So it was sort right. of it was just poetic in that way. Yeah. Um, and I know many readers, and this is this is where it becomes hard as a as a um, writer is writing a series you start getting um requests uh, yes or even demands from me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. Yep. um and uh i i considered to and not just because readers were asking for it but i considered how barrow would die in like yeah. a number of ways oh sure and, uh, i mean how could i not and right. every time it just didn't feel right it didn't feel yeah. right I, yeah. I, every time he he, I thought about killing him. I was like, no, no, it's not how he dies. And mm -hmm. and then it just kind of it just worked at the yeah. end when it came when it came to Jade Legacy. I just I knew that was that was yeah. where he was going to go. And it it made so much sense. And and Brian uh, from Bell Tube, his your comment about I like Barrow because I didn't I don't know how I'd feel living in that world, fearing feeling powerless to the clans. I know mm -hmm. that all of us probably or most of us if we were in that kind of a situation. I know if I could see people using this incredible strength producing, mm -hmm. you know, Jade, and I couldn't, right? I can't imagine how maddening, well, I can because Barrow showed us how, that, <laughs> how maddening that would be. But it, again, it makes sense. And as much as I resist that, <laughs> um, especially as a, as a lawn, unapologetic lawn fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I loved, and this is going into all the way into Jade Legacy, but the, the scene, one of my favorite scenes of Jade Legacy actually was the conversation between Nico and Barrow mm -hmm. because it was showing how lawn was still alive to me. Right. Because Nico was so his father in that moment. Right. And it was just, I cried because I was like, oh my gosh, he's, Lon's still here, <laughs> you know? And that was such a beautiful way to, you know, kind of let Barrow's character go out and also bring Nico in as, as the, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It was a yeah. Scene. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed that scene. And back to that thing that we talked about earlier where every antagonist is the protagonist of their own story. Yeah. Barrow's definitely the protagonist of his own story. And and in yep. another fantasy novel, he could, you know, you could set him up. Yeah. As, and, and there are plenty of fantasy novels that do this, right? He's the down on his luck, um, you know, opportunistic thief who's trying to stick it to the man and, and make yep. his way in this world and, you know, starts from the bottom and works his way up. Like he, he absolutely has the makings of what would be like a fantasy hero and sort of another yep. fantasy story. Yeah, the different perspective. Yeah, a kid from nowhere who learns how to use magic, and yeah, 
<laughs> it's it's a, that's a very kind of traditional hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was a question, and this was another couple, and I'll put it down because I know it's covering our faces. But but um, this was another set of side characters that I mm -hmm. really really loved. Um, sharing more tidbits about one's relationship with her brothers, Ken and Tar, and just Ken and Tar in, in general, I think, um, because there were two, three moments that I cried the hardest in this series. Obviously, one is at the end of Jade Legacy. I was mm -hmm. an absolute disaster for <laughs> a full day after that. But another one was Ken's death. That really, mm -hmm. and it was one of those things yeah. where I didn't realize how much I had come to lean on him as a character subtly. Right subconsciously until he was gone. And I, mm -hmm. I think it seemed like that was very much how he fit into the call family where right. they, they didn't realize what, what a big hole that was going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I did, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think what happens to, I think the, the make brothers in particular, Oh. Um, what happens to me? <laughs> those are some of the worst. Those are some of the scenes I feel it's the absolute awful. most guilty about. I, yeah. I remember I had a re I had a really hard time writing Tar's death. Oh, I, I was, believe it. It, it, it. it was just. Well, I cried at that one too. <laughs> tragic. Tragic. Um, yeah. But to the point of like more, of, but Wen's relationship with her her brothers. Um, I. Um, I think one of the things that for me makes Wen and her brothers so compelling as characters is that they are kind of they're kind they're they're the Cinderella story in a green yeah. in the Greenbone world. Yeah, right? they rise to such a high position of power, and um, it seems like they they you know they have this sort of this shameful background, but they they're like these superstars, they rise to such a high level, but it costs them so much and it's so, so tragic. Right. So in a way they are kind of like the, I mean, they, they are the cautionary tale, if you will, mm -hmm. like they, they become um, so, they give themselves over completely to the clan and to the call family and to Jade and, um, and they pay so dearly for it. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's especially, I think, um, uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't think I planned it this way. But the fact that the calls have um, two older brothers and then the younger sister and the mm -hmm. mates do as well just ended up kind of like parallel paralleling yeah. and being so perfect in that way. And I think um, you know, in a way, um, Wen and Shay have because and their friendship really speaks to this as well. They yeah. also occupy somewhat similar roles in their families, and that um, when Wen is the one who. You know, because she's a stone eye, she can't go to call the academy and train to be a green bone. She's always, always feels like um, she's a detriment to her family. She always has a chip on her shoulder. She's always trying to prove herself, and she kind of becomes, um, even she she goes above and beyond. She becomes like right. one of the most devoted, most hardworking, most um, you know, most de uh, dedicated members of the clan because she's trying to compensate. Um, right. And then that sort of, in some ways, parallels, um, you know, Shay trying to live up to her brothers and like being this, this, the, the youngest granddaughter and mm -hmm. trying to be as, as well respected as a green bone as, as they are. Um, but right. I think when has, she has such a, a different nurturing role with her brothers. Mm -hmm. And even the things, there's little tidbits in the in the series of how she like packs their lunches. She walks yeah. out to you know, give give their lunches to them as they get in the car with you and they drive off to patrol their territories. Yeah. Or you know how she's like really good at getting blood stains out of their shirts and things like that. <laughs> Which so is she, so adorable because <laughs> it's such a domestic moment where you have, you know, when packing lunches for these like giant green bone warriors, <laughs> you know, and it's such a like sweet yeah. And I imagine them being like those really like cute bento lunches too. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> they're probably like, I mean, nice little boxes. they're probably really attractive and they're tasty. And, but, um, but yeah, but Wen is a very, um, she just, she has a very caretaker personality mm -hmm. um, and, and a very sort of independent, um, very, yeah, personality who's she, she, 
<laughs> even the way she like match makes like, her <laughs> other members of the family and um and she stays in touch with uh, Ken's wife after he dies and is so yeah. involved in like with her with her um nephew so those I, I i think like when was one of the one of my most satisfying characters to write mm -hmm. um because so often there's this this sense in fantasy fiction that strong female characters are the like badasses warriors, the yep. warriors and there are yep. definitely some badass warriors for sure in the story but when as is a warrior in a completely different way in her own way. Yes. Um, and, and she also pays the price for that. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get away unscathed by any means. Right. Um, but I, I liked writing a character who's so much a part of this story that has a lot of fighting and violence and, yeah. and green bone, you know, badassery, but she, and she holds her own, but in, yeah. a, it, but with her own strength. In her own way. Well, and as someone who's a wife and a mother, like I really loved seeing that strength in her and how she is a caretaker and she's very nurturing. You know, she's not out there wielding the the talon knives and, you know, but but she's an incredibly, incredibly pivotal character in this mm -hmm. series. And I really, really loved that. Um, Anitha, can you frame it with spoilers now? Because I don't, maybe Fonda, you remember what you wrote in chapter four. I'm assuming these are like the last two chapters. Maybe. I think so. It might be. Um, well, and, oh, and no. mentioning. They're, they're either the last two or they're, or they're, they're or they're Ruse chapters. I have the book right here. I suppose I could look, but um, kind oh, of. Oh, yeah, going. yeah. No, this is, this, this is Ruse chapters. Okay. Oh, yes. That was, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that was brutal. I, I bet to write it. <laughs> you know, so the, so um, there's a peek at kind of how things happen behind the scenes. I remember I turned in a draft um, of Jade Legacy to my editor. And um, this was during the pandemic. <laughs> things were slow. <laughs> but she, yeah. um, I, I remember that um, we had this long kind of editorial conversation about what revisions I was going to do. And it's a, it's a big book. So there's a long conversation. There's a lot of ground to cover. And one of the things my editor said was she was like, you know, I, I wanted to feel like more devastated in those chapters. <laughs> she thought they weren't so it's her fault. <laughs> sad enough. Yeah. And so I, you know, I made sure that I, address that concern of hers and yeah <laughs> so now we all know who to, who to point fingers at yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that that was that was hard to write well and and two as a as a writer i think sometimes readers you know when when we as readers read a scene that that really impacts us emotionally and it's really it's really hard and it hurts we can go talk to other people that have read the books and we right. can we can commiserate as an author when you're alone in your writing cave yeah there's no one, I, there's no one <laughs> there's no one there <laughs> it's like i just got to be sad by myself for yeah. like two years before yeah. anyone else understands right yeah that's that is a very interesting and difficult part of the the writer process yeah it is hard sometimes um to not shy away mm -hmm. right from from being as um just just sticking to your guns right and and doing what the story demands even when you know it's going to hurt you it's going to hurt the readers but you just you know like you i can tell and it's not like i'm i i like to think i'm not being um just arbitrary in my right. choices of who dies and who lives because yeah I, I really do sort of think really carefully about what what is the right ending for this character, and oftentimes, right. and sometimes the end the the right ending is not a good one or not not an easy one to write and not an easy yeah. one to read. But it, I've never I don't think I've ever killed or not killed a character and then regretted it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, knowing what's the right choice for that specific character, even though it's hard. Well, and uh, going back to Tar, I mean. I, I've kind of found an interesting parallel in a way between Tar and Barrow because they're completely mm -hmm. different characters, but you are contrast rather because you have Barrow who is destroyed by the want of Jade 
Yeah. And you have Tar, who is destroyed by having it. Right. And that was such an interesting contrast to me between the two of them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and both, you know, tragic in their own way to see, you know, this whole life, like Tar just throws his whole life into mm -hmm. his Jade and, and serving the clan. And Barrow throws his whole life into trying to get Jade and it destroys both of them. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that was a really cool heartbreaking, but cool contrast right. um, for those two. Right. Yeah. I've had people ask me before what Jade is meant to represent in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And it can, in my mind, it can represent a lot of things, yeah. but it is, um, I mean, it could be, it, it is a stand in like right, mm -hmm. for, for money, for power, for drugs, for weapons, what, whatever it is yeah. that has, that is, coveted but also has a corrupting influence that has right. it can it it can be used in um for good but oftentimes it 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 ends up creating uh you know so much tragedy and and, right. and loss of life and um and so i i never wanted to kind of shy away from that aspect mm -hmm. because i think there's a lot of and and i i know that uh, people have talked about how in fantasy magic has to have a cost mm -hmm. um, and you'll hear different sort of points of view on that and yeah. you know does magic have to have a cost and but i i sort of think of it maybe a little bit more pragmatically which is just mm -hmm. in our world no resource really exists for free you know? right. <laughs> and there's right. and there's always there's always economics and there's always politics behind pretty much everything um so uh magic or a magic substance wouldn't mm -hmm. be any different um, and I, I'm also like, while I'm building this world, it is cool, right? Like who wouldn't, I mean, <laughs> it's very cool. Right. And I mean, I, you, you can imagine wanting to be like a green warrior and of course it's yeah. cool. And like, there's this culture and there's, you know, they have all these, um, these cool powers and the, and, and there's that, that mystique, that sort of sexiness to green life and culture in the world right. that I'm depicting. Yeah. But I also wanted it to always be balanced, right? By like right. the yep. dark side. So there's never any like you're you're always you're you're always sort of seeing story. Yeah. Cause it it's, you know, when you're in the middle of it and it's all you've ever known, there's a there's a romanticization that happens right. of this is the right way or you know, the the better or superior. And you definitely get a lot of that from, you know, the green bone culture that yeah. you know, we're the superior beings protecting the, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then you have Barrow who right. kind of shatters that right lamp in in a way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And and speak going back to chapters forty nine and fifty that were brought up earlier. One of the reasons why, in my mind, that was such an important scene was because it is the point at which Hilo really realizes yeah. the cost of being a green right. bone. And it's a very personal cost. And that's you know, a turning point for him in his life where um, you know, he understands that he sits at the top of a pyramid and that pyramid and the culture that he created is why his son died young. Um, yeah. So that's why that those two scenes, I was like- And that's important. That, that was important. That was important for that story. Right. Going all the way back, to Jade City. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned this before we went live because I want to talk about Lon and I'm still not over it. <laughs> and it's been months <laughs> since I read Jade City. Um, it was such a it was such a gutsy move as a writer. And, and you've talked a little bit about like not being afraid to put the big things in before the end of this of the series. But how did how did you come to the decision that Lon was going to die halfway through book one? And how do you feel it affected the rest of the trilogy? I knew from the start. Mm -hmm. I, when I conceived of the story, I knew that Lon would die partway through. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote with that in mind. Yeah. But the challenge for me was making sure that Lon was a fully developed character for the period of time that we got him. So right. his death had to mean a lot because it is, it's where this conflict really erupts and it drives right. the entire rest of the trilogy. So it has to drive <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of pages. Of <laughs> right. It has to be a big deal. Um, and in my, that, in my early drafts, you know, it, um, it wasn't there yet because it didn't feel like, it felt like Lon was being set up to die. Um, and yeah. 
that's that's part of the beauty of revision is getting it to to the place where you yep. envision it. And I knew that you had I needed to do as much with Lon as I could in the time that I had with him, so that it it felt like he he could have very easily just survived and continued to do a whole bunch of more stuff. Like he had right. plans, you know, he yep. had he had stuff going on. Like you knew that like he was. Uh, he was a competent person who had like all of these things going for him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the, that's what makes, I guess, deaths most impactful and tragic in fiction, um, you know, and, and in real life is when, when it, it's so, it's like you lost so much potential, right? You lost right. so much opportunity. Right. And um, I wanted Lon to be there for the rest of the series too. I mean, even though yep. he's gone, yep. there's there's still plenty of times the characters bring him up. Right? Like he's yep. it's such a big influence on on all of them. I mean, Andin especially. Yep. Um, and there are places where I brought him back in flashback, mm -hmm. where it made sense for kind of his voice to appear. Um, yeah. So that that was um, I, I I and I think it's a sign that it worked that he's still considered a main character. I mean, if you think about it, oh, he's 100%. actually in the series <laughs> for, <laughs> for, I guess, like maybe 20% of the page count, but he he's still like, he's still in my mind, certainly one of the main characters. And he's still, I think the main character in a lot, a lot of characters. Oh yeah. Mind. Well, and, and I think you, that's exactly how I experienced him through the trilogy was in every decision that was made in every conversation between especially Hilo and Shay, whenever they had conversations, whenever, you know, as soon as Nico en enters the story at all, you know, there's so many different places where Lon is just there mm -hmm. the whole time, constantly, even the conversations between Shay and Night Mata. I mean, there's, right. you yeah. know, every place Lon is just, almost large he almost becomes that like immortal deity of the series because he's just there everywhere all the time um which i wasn't mad about but i also was sad that he was not right because i keep reminding you right <laughs> i know I keep, i'm Why not gonna you let you do that, do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know for somebody who yeah the 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 hurting your readers question from earlier like you do a very good job of it Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, Anita had another question and I'll bring it up, but again, kind of like we talked about before, I don't know if you'll have a specific answer for your readers on this, but you're welcome to if you do have one. <laughs> well, wrong depends on your point of view. Mm -hmm. So um, that particular scene, I... Uh, my my goal was to was to write it in a way that was true to who Hilo was yep. as a person. Um, so you you may condemn him, but you understand why he did it. Mm -hmm. And in his moral code, right, the moral code of Greenbone, yep. you just that was the right thing to do. Like in his mind, he he was out. He had to bring Nico home. Like there was just no there was no other option. There was no other option. And yep. he, you know, in his mind. Th that was a non-negotiable. He, he, there, there's no greater moral code for Hilo than the clan and the and the family. And so like, he, right. he was just unthinkable for him that he couldn't bring he can bring Lon's son home. So, right. um, can you be? Hor are, are, did were readers horrified? horrified? Of course, Absolutely. of course, they're, of course, readers were horrified. But, um, but like, my job's not really to um, make readers comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I think that for me at least, he, Hilo, uh, like once Lon was gone, I related to Hilo most often because I tend to be a very instinctual person and a very emotionally driven person and loyal to kind of a fault <laughs> where I will sometimes make decisions where I'm like, I probably should have thought about that first. <laughs> so Hilo was very relatable to me. And I, I think recognizing and again not making your readers comfortable but recognizing the the parts of ourselves that when taken to extremes what does that look like you know mm -hmm. and that that mm -hmm. horror of 
how can somebody that I'm so compelled by and relate to do something like that? Mm -hmm. What does that say mm -hmm. about me as a person? Like there's right. a lot of really important conversations for us as readers to have with ourselves during mm -hmm. the course of a book like that, that I think decisions like that. Cause again, I understood hundred percent why he made, like, I knew I was right. like, yep, I'm not surprised by it, but I'm horrified yeah. that he actually did it. Right. <laughs> Right. but I'm not surprised. Right. So, yeah. yeah and I mean, there's, scene. there's a scene later on in Jade Legacy where um, he, he's explaining to Nico yep. what happened and he, but to him, it's like having a conversation, you know, an upfront conversation Yeah, you know, with a kid about sort of the realities of life and, and, and um, his worldview is, con is consistent, right? right. Like, he, consistent. I think, I think that, that those couple of scenes, right? The, that whole situation with Nico and and his his mom um, was a way for me to kind of um, force readers to to uh, realize that they've been they've they've bought in, yeah. right? But I have made you buy in yeah. to like this culture. Yeah. And you're if you're rooting for these characters, right? They you have to kind of understand that, like, also I've I've made you complicit in a way. Right? Right. And, and so there's a, um, uh, and, and so I actually, I, but I actually found that particular, I, I enjoyed that part of the story in kind of a, a slight, in a bit of a twisted way. Yeah. Because to me, one of the um, most sort of unsung, but deeply important parts of world building in a fantasy world is the moral code and the social mm -hmm. norms that are in mm -hmm. that world. So it's so often that when we build fantasy worlds, we think about kind of the superficial stuff, like mm -hmm. what is the, like not superficial, but you know, the clothing, the, um, the tech, the, you know, uh, the, the food, like all that sort of stuff, which is of course important, but underpinning all that is the, the view of the world, right? And like mm -hmm. the way that they view morality mm -hmm. and their relationship to society is also a huge part of world building, right? Like we have to remember in our right. own world, there was a time when human sacrifice was perfectly normal. And right. in fact, was the right thing to do. Like you, right. it was the moral thing to do was to sacrifice right. these people to the gods. And when you're building a fantasy world, you know, you're, you're saying that I'm creating a, a completely, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ex using my imagination to create this world. And um, if I, if, if I don't think through kind of all the implications um, mm -hmm. of the world, but just sort of infuse it with my normal, like, 21st century Western civilization attitudes, I'm not doing a complete job of world building. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think some of those moments where you're like uncomfortable with the moral choices that the characters make I, um, are are deliberate. I did that right. deliberately. Right, yeah. Because it's supposed to think and not, like you said, I enjoy, I don't know if enjoy is the right word. I appreciate <laughs> moments in stories like that where it makes me pause in my headlong rush through the story to question how I'm thinking about it and and why you know and like you said where you've bought into that because i think at that point in the story we've kind of started to some of us at least have kind of started to romanticize and idolize the culture and Hilo specifically as a character kind of represents that and then all of a sudden we're forced to confront this very clear moral code that he has that we've known the whole time mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. it wasn't a surprise right yeah and I mean, really, if you've bought in and you've paid attention to all my world building, you're probably not surprised. I mean, you maybe you're surprised in the moment, but nope. afterwards you probably shouldn't be. <laughs> that was the scariest part was that I wasn't surprised. When he made that decision, yeah. I was like, okay, <laughs> I knew he wasn't leaving this house. I knew it when he walked in the door the first time. Right, I knew right. that this was probably the outcome, which is which is crazy. And I love that. Yeah, Nico, totally agree. A great note on world building. Um and it, it, it is hard to, like you said, kind of go deeper than just the typical 21st century sensibilities that, that we have now and say, but how do these people view the world and how is that different? Yeah. Um, 
we've kind of gone through my Hilo and, and Shay kind of things, but both of them have such dynamic in different ways, but such dynamic arcs through the story. And when you come across those moments, like the decisions that they make that, you know, people have to stop and, and like try to figure out where they're at with their moral code in the story. How do you trust yourself in those moments as a writer? When, you know, when do you know I need to lean into this and really push myself further and not hold back from what might make me or my readers uncomfortable? Right. I try to remember that I owe it to the characters mm -hmm. and that it's more important that I am um, true to my story and to what my characters um, would do uh, rather than what would make readers happy. Right. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you can't know, um, you know, who's going to read your book, how many people are going to read it. All you have at the end of the day, especially before you have a book deal, before right. it's ever published, is just you and the page. Um, and, and so um, you gain nothing at that point from chickening out or right. you know, not, not pushing the story as far as you can push it. Um, yep. So, uh, you know, I, I think that um, just, being, just being authentic to mm -hmm. the characters and the story is will we'll show through in the end um yeah you can do it yeah absolutely so kind of as a wrap up i know you mentioned that you're doing a lot you have a lot of projects on your plate right now and i would love to know what what can we expect next from you just had untethered sky recently come out yeah. which congratulations on that i'm really excited to read it um what's what's cooking currently in the fond du Lis kitchen yeah <laughs> Well, on Greenbone Saga front, there's um, stuff going on. So there's uh, new um, special editions that are coming out. There's um, game development. There's TV development that is proceeding along. We'll see where it goes. You never know with Hollywood. Um, right. so there's stuff going on on that front. Um, I am working on my next novel, which is a science fiction standalone. Okay. Um, so I'm going back to sci-fi nice. and, uh, and kind of flipping the other side of the coin for a little bit um, and yep. it is what I've been calling my cyberpunk samurai space opera so it's it is called the last contract <laughs> of Isako and I'm drafting it right now so um, oh my goodness you will see that uh, probably next year and really I'm funny. also co-writing a project with Shannon Lee the daughter of Bruce Lee I'm oh going wow back to YA and she approached me and wanted to do a martial arts fantasy um, that honored her father and his life cool. and his, um, philosophy. So I'm working on that as well. And then after all of that, I've got uh, another series in mind, but that is a ways down the road. Yeah. Another fantasy well, series. Well, that's a lot. I mean, I signed me up for all of that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so excited for you because this, this world is, is so rich and exciting and knowing that you know it's going to be expanded upon potentially is is very exciting to me because I, I can't wait to see more of it um especially in a visual realm i'm sure for as a author too that that's very exciting the idea of seeing it in a visual realm too yeah i mean even like the cool art that goes with the upcoming special editions is yeah <laughs> cool i can't so even cool. share any of it yet but i'm like <laughs> when can i share it it's so cool. more secrets <laughs> yeah so that's awesome. And for, for people who are maybe brand new, um, who Greenbone is obviously, again, the, the one that you're probably best known for, but if somebody wants to taste test mm -hmm. a Fonda Lee story, do you have recommendations for kind of where people might start in your canon of work? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people do start with Jade City because it's the start of the Greenbone saga. Yep. But I have a real um, fondness for my, for my debut, Zero Boxer. Um, so I always say, especially if you like science fiction and it's a standalone, um, there's that. And then um, if you really just want to, to taste, Untethered Sky is a novella. So it's a really quick, fun um, read. And, yeah. and that would give you a, a um, taste of my work as well. Yeah. And that one, correct me if I'm wrong, but that one is kind of a little bit more of a older, like ancient yeah. fantasy setting. Yeah. 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 It's my um, monster hunting fantasy memoir novella. So it's, uh, it's set, it is, it's sort of pre-modern era um, nice. where 
um, it's a, and it's about a young woman who trains giant birds of prey to hunt manticores. Nice. Love it. So for anybody who is in the chat or watching the replay down in the description box below, I have links to Fonda's website. So you can go and check out all of her work. And if you, for whatever reason, haven't gotten her on your TBR yet, you absolutely should because incredible, incredible character writing and world building and all of the wonderful things. And I can't recommend them highly enough. And Fonda, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tori. This was a lot of fun. And thank you to everyone who's watching and for your great questions in the chat too. Yeah, thank you so much, chat, for hanging out with us. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will see you in the next video. Thank see you. See you guys later.